Good evening, 12th Street. My name is Luke Parker. I'm one of the ministry associates here in our faith family. And I'm looking forward to continuing as we walk through the book of Philippians in our Wednesday night sermon series. Uh, before I do that, though, I just want to encourage us all, in case you can't tell by the decorations behind me or if you just haven't heard yet, uh, we're in the middle of our virtual VBS this week. Our kids for the past two days have been watching our live stream on Facebook and YouTube uh, in the morning and have been logging and pulling up our website and participating in all these fun activities even in the middle of this pandemic when we can't have normal VBS like we have in the past. And what I want to encourage us all to do tonight is to pray for all of the kids, all of the parents, the families that will and have already been reached by this event. Uh, we believe here at 12th Street that God has chosen to orchestrate this week in such a way that we were able to live stream our virtual VBS so that we could potentially reach more people than we would have in person. So what I want to encourage us to do tonight before we look at Philippians is to pray for tomorrow, our final day of VBS. Um, we just want to pray that as the gospel is proclaimed and shared with the kids, that it would be done so in a way that is easy for them to understand, to comprehend, and that someone somewhere, wherever they are when they watch this, that they would be receptive of that message, that they would be convicted by the Holy Spirit in their heart, that God would move within them, and that they would accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. So if you would with me, before we even open up to our text tonight, I want to pray specifically for VBS and then pray for our time together tonight. Let's pray. Father, we come to you tonight just humbled and grateful and thankful that even in the middle of all of this COVID-19 that you have allowed us to take part in the unfolding of your great and divine plan, God. Uh, even as some churches around us are still unsure of whether or not they're even going to have a VBS, God. We want to pray for ours, pray for the kids and the families that have already and will be watching tomorrow, that you would work in them and through them, use this virtual VBS in such a way, God, that we could never comprehend or would have never been able to have guessed two months ago that you would have been able to use us here at 12th Street. We pray that someone would come to a saving faith and believe in you, that you would work in ways that are so great and so wonderful that we could never even begin to comprehend how you are using us, God. We pray that you would be made known around our city, our county, our state, and that in the midst of this time where there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of unknown, there's a lot of bitterness and hatred flying all around us, God, that you would be the calm in the storm, that you would get us through it, that you would bless our time tonight, God, as we try to grow closer to you in the midst of all of this, in the midst of all the chaos, God, as we read your word, I pray that you would bless our time tonight, that your word would be proclaimed clear and true, and that you would just use me as a vessel, as a tool for your kingdom, that we would just hear your word proclaimed, God, and that you would speak to us. We ask all this in your name. Amen. So, in the past couple of weeks, we have gotten to the point where we have finished the first chapter of Philippians, and we are now working our way through chapter 2. Uh, last week, Pastor Thomas led us through the first four verses of Philippians 2, and I just want to review real fast over those four verses, just read back over them, because they give a lot of great context. They set up tonight's passage perfectly, but our main text tonight is going to be Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. So I'm going to read verses 1 through 4, and then we will read our main text, verses 5 through 11 tonight. So starting in verse 1, it says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, 
being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. And then our main text tonight. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, all to the glory of God the Father. So tonight, our main point from verses 5 through 11 is that we should all strive to live as Christ lived, in humility and obedience. Now, where do we get that? Well, verses 5 through 11 show us how we are to live. Verse 5 specifically, it is a reminder of what we have just read in verses 1 through 4, as Pastor Thomas preached on last week. And then verse 5 sets up the main passage, the main point of tonight, by saying, summarizing verses 1 through 4, by saying, have this mind, the mind that he has explained to the church in Philippi in verses 1 through 4, have this mind among yourselves. And then he tells us the greatest example of where we find that when he says, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Paul tells us at the start of this passage that our minds, our lives as believers, should reflect that of Jesus. And what better example, what better model for us to live our lives after than Jesus? He is the perfect example, the perfect model in every way. And we should strive to look as much like him as we possibly can. We will stumble and we will fall, but that is because we ourselves are flawed humans. We are sinful creatures, and that has defaced us. It has scarred us, and it is impossible for us to be perfect as Jesus was perfect. But our righteousness comes from him, and we should strive to live like he lived. The way we live our lives should be in accordance with the way that God would have us live. As he has told us in his word, and as Jesus demonstrated for us in the flesh as he came and lived his life here on this earth. So that's just verse 5. Then we get to the bulk of this passage. And the best way that I know to explain this that I've shared with other people leading up to tonight is that if Philippians, the four chapters of Philippians were a four-course meal, then tonight's passage would be the steak, the bulk, the entree of the meal, and specifically verses 6 through 8 in that. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, God has been working in me, and I have just exhausted myself working through this passage. It is so deep and so wide that we could talk about this for hours. But what I want to do is for us to just take a bite out of Philippians tonight, out of this passage. I just want us to talk about the example that Jesus set for us as he lived humbly and lived obediently during his time on this earth. So verses 6 through 8, verse 5 ends with, which is yours in Christ Jesus, and then when we pick up in verse 6, it says, Who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. When Jesus emptied himself, as we see in verse 7, Jesus did not give up any of his divine attributes, any of his divine power, or any of his status as God. When Jesus came and was born as a baby, and grew up and lived as a man just like the rest of us, Jesus was still 100% God. Jesus lived his life 100% God, 100% man. He emptied himself of nothing when it comes to his divine attributes. If anything, he emptied himself 
verse 7 says, He emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. So verse 7, it says that Jesus emptied himself by adding something to himself. Emptying by addition. And as Jesus lived his life, fully God, fully man, he did not consider himself to be equal to God, although he was. Instead, he chose willingly to leave his position of authority and power in heaven. He chose to leave that and to come down to this broken world to serve us and to save us. Do you see the humility in that, in that simple choice of leaving all of his power and authority behind? Not that he didn't have it when he came, but he chooses not to use it and to live the life that we could never live. Jesus, God in the flesh, did not wish to use his authority for his own benefit, but chose to come and live the life that we could never live, which is a perfect life. And yet he experienced every struggle and temptation that we may face. When we stumble and when we fall short of God's design, God's original intent for us, we can rest assured in the hope and the assurance that Jesus has defeated all of that temptation and sin on our behalf as he resisted every temptation that we may face. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, and yet without sin. That passage cannot be more clearly referring to Jesus unless it said his name specifically. Hebrews 4.15 tells us that Jesus was tempted in every sin that we could possibly face today. And yet, he did not falter from God's will. Not once did he fall into sin. He defeated sin for us. Not only that, he defeated sin when he chose to be obedient. Verse 8 says, He chose to be obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus defeated sin when he died on the cross and rose again three days later. If Jesus would have died on the cross and that would have been the end of the story, then he would have not been our Savior. Those three days are crucial to the message of the gospel. Because if Jesus doesn't rise back to life, then he is not who he says he was. He is not the Messiah. He is not the Son of God. But we know that he rose again and that he is alive today. To be crucified, to be put to death on a cross, was to be humiliated, publicly scorned and mocked. Back in Jesus' days, Roman citizens who controlled Israel, controlled the places where Jesus lived and walked each and every day, the Roman citizens were rarely executed in this form or fashion. And the Jews even believed that if you were executed on a cross, you were cursed. That's how ashamed you should be to be put to death on a cross. It was and is the most excruciatingly painful way to die. And it showed that the one who was put to death on the cross was beyond contempt. There was no hope of saving them, of restoring them, and they were considered worthless. And their worthlessness was magnified by all of the physical torture and public shame that they had to endure. And Jesus chose to go through that for you and for me. When Jesus chose to die on the cross, he chose to be obedient, to submit himself to his Father's will, and died the most painful death, the death that we all deserve, both physically and spiritually. When Jesus died on the cross for the first time in all of eternity, Jesus experienced separation from his heavenly Father for the first time ever. God's wrath was poured out in its entirety onto Jesus. And God's wrath and justice, when Jesus experienced that, he cried out because the weight of our sins, it's it's too much for any one of us to bear. And yet Jesus willingly 
went through all of that suffering, all of that pain for you and for me. He chose to be humble, to live a life of service, to serve us. And then he chose to sacrifice himself in this way. Jesus chose to be obedient even if it meant his own death, even if it meant his own demise, because he knew that his father's plan was for this to happen even before the foundation of the world. When God created the heavens and the earth, as we read in Genesis chapter 1, God knew that we would one day sin, that we would step away from his presence. And God knew that he would send his only son to die on the cross to make it possible for the relationship between God and man to be restored. And Jesus did that when he lived the life that we could not live, could never live, and when he died the death that we deserve to die on the cross. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Jesus alone could pay the price for our sins. David Platt talks about this in one of his secret church uh, sessions where he is discussing cults and counterfeit gospels. He first starts it off with our need, our desperate need to understand the one true gospel of the one true God. And he explains the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, explains how Jesus was the perfect sacrifice when he says, As perfect man, Jesus alone is able to substitute for human sin. And, as perfect God, Jesus alone is able to satisfy divine judgment. This quote, this moment right here where Jesus being 100% God, 100% man, it proves that him alone, Jesus was the only one who was able to meet the mark to pay the price of our sins, to take away that debt in its full. Jesus was the only one who could ever save us. And he didn't have to, but he chose to. God wants you and me to be invited back into his presence once again. The relationship that we destroyed when we chose to sin, when we choose to sin to this day, God made it possible for us to make it all right again. Because Jesus made it right. Jesus sacrificed himself and chose to die for us. And then verses 9 through 11, we see that the humility and the obedience that Jesus shows, we see that the reward that awaited him for this was beyond anything that we could ever imagine. Verses 9 through 11 says, Therefore, because of what Jesus has done, because of the humility and the obedience that he has shown, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, all to the glory of God the Father. Because of the humility and obedience that Jesus displayed on the cross, God exalted him above every other name. Jesus' life as a servant and his death on the cross shows that he perfectly embodies John 15 when John writes that greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Jesus looked at us rebels Sinners, living in open rebellion to our Creator, to our Maker, to our own Father. Jesus looked at us and said, no, they're worth saving. I'm going to save them because I love them. He looked at us broken people and called us friends and made it possible for us to be adopted back into God's family as sons and daughters of the one true God. By being obedient and humbling himself on the cross out of this love, Jesus shows that he is who he says he is. He is the Son of God, because only the Son of God could make that choice, could make the choice to die for all of mankind. And he rose again three days later, victorious over Satan, sin, death, and hell. He conquered the grave, 
And God highly exalted him and declared him Lord over all. If you look back in the Greek, when it says that God has bestowed on him the name that is above every name, the word that is used there is the word Yahweh. Jesus is Lord over all. God has given him this title because of his choice to save us, to be obedient to the Father's will. Jesus is now exalted over everything. He is sitting on the throne, and one day, verse 10 tells us, we will face him. We will come face to face before him in the presence of God. And verse 10 says that every knee will bow in heaven, in the earth, and underneath the earth. Every one of us will bow before Jesus one day. And we will confess with our tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord. All for the glory of God the Father. Jesus is Lord of all. Right now, He is living. And He still, to this day, loves you more than you could ever imagine. He loves me more than I could ever imagine. For all of the sins that I have committed and ever will commit, Jesus died 2,000 years ago for that. All of the sins that you have committed and ever will commit, Jesus died for that sin. We talked at the beginning of this session about how we apply this, how we live out this humility, this obedience that Jesus lived out. The way that we do this, the way that we apply this passage to our lives is that we have to strive. We have to want to live like Jesus. We have to want to be humble and obedient to God in all that we do. What we can learn from these verses is that if we keep and obey the commandments that God has given us, we will be exalted one day. Like Jesus, our bodies will be glorified, we will be made right with God, and we will get to spend eternity in His presence, worshiping Him, bowing at the feet of Jesus forever. And what a joy it must be to live that life of humility and obedience as Jesus did, and to step into eternity that one day that we all pass away, to step into the presence of God and to hear the words, Well done, my good and faithful servant. What a joy it must be to live a life in service of the one who created you. To complete the task that has been given to us. To finally step before God the Father and to see that Jesus is sitting on the throne and that he is Lord of all, exalted above every other name. May we strive as a church, as believers, as individuals, to have this Christ-like mindset in the way that we live our lives to follow his example of humility, of obedience in all that we do. We should strive, we should want to live this life. We should want to be like Jesus. That's why he has saved us, to make us more like him, so that we would be found acceptable, holy, and blameless before the Father. He has died on the cross and rose again to take our burden, our guilt, our shame, our fear, all of our sin away. He died to take that away. I don't know who is watching this right now. And I don't know what you are going through in the middle of this pandemic. I don't know what you have gone through in your life. But I feel like now would be a better time than ever to at least consider, if you haven't already, to consider giving your life over to Christ, to submitting yourself to the Father's will as Jesus did, to live in humility and obedience to His will. Jesus did. And the Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. Today, tonight, right now, as you are watching this live stream, whether it be at your home or on the beach somewhere, or three months from now, whenever you are watching this, however you are watching this, God is calling you right now in this moment to repent of your sins and believe in Him, to declare that Jesus is the Lord of your life, because He is, and we just read that 
you will declare that he is one day. But God is giving you the chance to declare him Lord of your life right now. I pray, it's my prayer, that you would. That someone, somewhere, would accept Jesus as their Lord right now. I'm so honored and so humbled to be able to just get up and preach God's word tonight. To read through the scripture and to be used by God in this way. I'm thankful that for those of you that are watching that you have chosen to watch this live stream to strive to get a little closer to God. Because what that tells me is that somewhere there is a person who wants to be like Jesus. And there is no better one that we can choose to follow than him. I pray that you would give your life over to him tonight. Let's pray. God, I can't even begin to put into words the feelings, the emotions that are going through my head, my heart, my soul right now, God. A lot of anxiousness and anxiety is just floating around this world right now, God. And we pray that somewhere in the midst of this, people are reaching out to you. We pray that they are seeking your presence. And God, I pray that tonight you have moved in someone's heart in a way that you would call them back into your presence, that someone would be saved, that someone would come to a saving faith, and that they would realize, that they would choose to believe that Jesus died for their sins, and that Jesus has taken all of the guilt and shame away from us, God. That he has made it possible for us to be made right with you. And God, I pray that tonight as we close up this passage, but look ahead to next week of what the rest of Philippians has in store for us, God, I pray that you would continue to bless our time together as we dive into your word each and every week. And Father, as we look ahead to this coming Sunday, as we open up our doors as a building to begin meeting in person again in the wake of this COVID-19 pandemic. God, I pray that you would keep us safe, that you would bless our time together, that you would bring people back into your church. Because God, if one thing is for sure, this pandemic has made it very easy for us to become disengaged and to disassociate ourselves from you. God, we pray for the people that will be left in the aftermath of this pandemic who are struggling right now as we pray, God, that you would give us opportunities to reach them for your kingdom, that we would be able to share your gospel with them. And God, I just ask all of this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen.